Whether you've watched Midsommar one time or far too many times, chances are this is the image that's been most vividly burned into your memory. Okay, maybe not the only one, but there's so much to be read from Danny's smile in these final fleeting frames. Just before the movie cuts to black and leaves us to think about the bright and sunshiny depravity we just witnessed. The initial critical response was that of overwhelming delight and you go girlism at the idea of this protagonist shedding the toxic relationship in her life and embracing a new family that cares for her in the way she deserves. Not long after that came a barrage of counterpoints explaining that this was in fact not a happy ending for Danny. That the movie has, in its own clever little way, brainwashed its audience into excusing murder in the same way the villainous cult of the story has done to our poor, impressionable protagonist. Well, being the edgelord hipster YouTuber that I am, I think both of these critical responses represent two equally valid interpretations that, when considered together, reveal an even clearer picture that even more accurately captures the essence of what makes this movie, and more specifically, its oddly sublime ending, quite the unforgettable experience. So come along with me on this sacred dance of YouTube analyzation, if you wish, and let's talk about Midsommar and how its thought-provoking ending is created out of anything but a simple way of looking at things. But first... Do you guys want to take it now? Let's just take it now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you feel that? The energy? Midsommar follows Danny, an anxious 20-something with a penchant for worrying about her sister Terry, who just wants to kill their parents and herself in peace, which Danny's boyfriend Christian sees as bad news bears on account of he was so over the whole being Danny's boyfriend thing. So Christian ignores his true feelings like a real man and gives Danny a big bear hug to make it all better. Several months later, after upping their communication game, I just wanted to talk about it, that's all. I really think I should just leave. No! And finally moving past their codependency shtick, Please, come on, can you come? Just Christian makes an accident and forgets to tell Danny he's leaving for a Swedish vacay with his friends in two weeks. You already have a ticket. I'm sorry? So Christian expertly dodges the almost argument by inviting Danny to join the boys only trip, which the boys are super stoked to hear about. That's not completely ruining your guys' plans. Oh, sure, no, not at all. Giving Pele, the token suite of the group, an opportunity to explain to Danny just how hard his hometown Midsummer festival is gonna go this year. It's sort of a crazy nine day festival my family's doing. Lots of pageantry uh -huh. and dressing up. So after a happy little hop and a skip over to this fabled land of Sweden, Christian and the boys, and Danny, observe Pele as he engages in the foreign ritual of hugs and belly rubs before taking shrooms and getting funny with the grass. Everything's all cool, man, until Mark just had to go and say the F word. You're like my real, actual family. <laughs> Which brings Danny's vibe all the way down. Talk about a breakdown bummer, dude. That's you. And causes her to bug out, with a side of creepy sister flashback, before waking up the next morning and meeting the rest of Pele's happy tree gnome family. After kicking off their Midsummer festival that comes but once every 90 years, with a toast to partying like it's 1929, the Swedish tree people, also known as the Harga, do a mating jig and let their meat puppets meet and mingle before showing them to their designated dollhouse. Next, Christian gives Danny some cake because he loves her and it's her birthday. You didn't think I forgot, did you? The following day, Christian and friends, and Danny, watch as the two oldest geezers of the tribe make inappropriate dinner table noises. <laughs> before yeeting themselves off a cliff. Which makes Christian and friends, and Danny, a little uncomfortable. F this! You're f***ed! Until it's explained that pancaking oneself at the age of 72 is what all the cool old people do around here. It's the coolest! Afterwards, Christian explains to his best buddy Josh, who's writing his college thesis on the Harga, that he too will be writing his college thesis on the Harga, so now they could copy each other's homework. But Josh disapproves of the good news because he's no fun. What you're doing is unethical and leechy and lazy, and, and frankly, it's kind of sad. Meanwhile, Pele uses his magical forest hippie powers to brainwash Danny into believing she has worth. Danny, do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? While some of the side characters start getting fleshed out, beginning with Connie and Simon, who disappear mostly without a trace. Followed by Mark, who uses his twain to desecrate the Harga's favorite tree. So the Harga use Mark's twain against him. I'll show you. Okay. 
Now it's Josh's turn to pay for being an ignorant American, and for sneaking into the village library to take pics with the Harga's sacred coloring books. So Mark's body skin double arrives just in time to help set Josh's head right. The next day, Christian gets an invite to pass his gravy to a young Harga woman named Maya. You have been approved to mate with her who clued Christian into her interest one day prior by following the mantra, if you liked it, then you should have put a pube in its breakfast. I think I ate one of her pubic hairs. Sounds probably right. Meanwhile, Danny gets blitzed with the Harga ladies and tears up the dance floor so hard that they have no choice but to crown her May Queen, a super important position that requires her to eat raw fish, dance around raw meat, and catch Christian raw-dogging young Maya while all the elder village women witness baby's first insemination. Which leaves Danny sad, and with no choice but to do screaming exercises with her new besties. No, no, no. While Christian's post-drug-induced nut clarity kicks in, causing him to streak like a maniac across the Harga's pagan god-given land. But the Harga hates streaking, so they put Christian to sleep before waking him up and giving him even better news. You can't speak, you can't move, alright? Danny then gets promoted from May Queen to Slay Queen when the Harga give her the choice between killing some rando background extra or her poor, impaired boyfriend. Which all leads to Danny finally understanding the age-old Harga philosophy of when life hands you lemons, murder that deadweight loser in your life, and dance like all the pagan gods are watching. In my humblest opinion, the essence of what has created such a division of interpretations when it comes to Midsommar's ending all comes down to perspective. No shit, Sherlock. The movie is presented to us through the subjective perspective of its lead character, Danny. Thus, when the movie ends, we're left to digest this distasteful display of flowery delight through two opposing lenses, the emotional and the logical. Emotionally, we just went on a journey with this character that began in a place of isolation and despair and ended in a place of community and happiness. In other words, our main character overcame her loneliness and depression, so it's clearly a positive ending. Hooray! Taking a more detached and logical look, however, we also just witnessed a young woman get brainwashed into joining a cult and assisting in the murder of her boyfriend. In other words, our main character has been turned into a monster, so it's clearly a fucked up ending. As a result, the internet did what it does best and accepted that two very different takeaways from a movie can be equally true at the same time, and this fact in and of itself can speak to what makes the movie so interesting. No, they didn't. No, 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 they didn't. Anyway, I'm gonna take a shot at giving both perspectives a good faith looky-loo in hopes of extracting some more even-keeled insights. <laughs> Given that Midsommar is presented through Danny's protagonized perspective, we'll start by observing through her lens. The very first image we're shown pretty blatantly transmits to us the story that's about to unfold for Danny. And like the tone of the movie itself, it has a fairy tale veneer to it. The princess chained down by a dark and tragic fate, only to be ultimately released and replenished by the good people of a bright and shiny faraway land. And this showing of the tracks and the destination before the train has even left the station yet ties into a little theme we discussed in my last video on Bo is Afraid, a movie that also came from the totally stable mind of a fun-loving family man named Ari Aster. Out of the three movies he's written and directed thus far, Hereditary, Midsommar, and Bo is Afraid, each one expresses, in some way or another, the philosophy of determinism. The idea that human beings don't really possess the agency and free will they may think they possess. But unlike Hereditary and Bo, it's far more debatable if the outside forces guiding our protagonist's path are a net positive or a net negative for her overall well-being. Because unlike her unlucky group of so-called friends, Danny reaches her endpoint alive and seemingly happier than ever. And since we're committing to this whole flower princess fairy tale perspective, let's roll with it. Because as the movie begins by steeping us into Danny's depression era, her mood is reflective of the cold and lifeless isolation of the landscape she lives in. As we're introduced to the key dilemma Danny is faced with. She's a naturally anxious type, starved for love and affection, but at the same time registering this as a flaw within herself rather than a flaw in her surroundings. What if I have overwhelmed him? If that's the case, then good riddance, right? Not if I, I went too far, if I leaned too much. So when she's struck with that unfathomable familial tragedy, 
She clings ever tighter to the only family she has left in Christian, who's only still with Danny out of obligation, out of a feeling of it's what you're supposed to do. As a result, she doubles down on the assumption that she's wrong for expecting more out of Christian as she pushes the darkness of her isolation and her depression deeper and deeper within. Please, I'm not I'm not trying to attack you. It I'm really not. feels like you are. Well then, I, well, then I'm sorry. And this untended to darkness is visualized as a poisonous fog not unlike the poison her sister infected herself and their parents with, as if the essence of that dark deed has been passed into Danny, slowly destroying her from the inside. And what is this poison if not a debilitating depression from the misfortune she's been forced to bear? The movie poses the Harga as the antidote to this poisonous depression, the light that can flush out all that darkness within Danny. <laughs> And to do so, she needs to process her tragedy, to come to terms with death itself, to accept it rather than fear it. From this perspective, Christian and his friends are clearly the antagonists because they represent the tainted soil Danny is unable to blossom in. In the Western culture they come from, death is rarely acknowledged, let alone processed in a healthy, communal way. Instead, the focus of their society is individualism, self-fulfillment through competition, you. No, do not fuck me. Find your own subject. And the pursuit of carnal desire. Oh my god, the women here. What is it that makes them hotter? Christian and his friends are shown only under the spotlight of these base pursuits because these are the cravings their culture indoctrinates them into satisfying. Meanwhile, the Harga are a family focused on sharing both pain and happiness through connection and empathy, something Christian and his friends appear to have no discernible comprehension of, as their interactions with each other are shown as distant, surface level, and fragile enough to break from any tension. We don't associate as friends of his or collaborators or anything. And there's a deep knowing in Danny that this is what's been missing in her world, attending to and validating of her emotions from a trusted community which is exemplified in her good trip going bad the moment Mark utters the word family. <laughs> Juxtaposed against Danny hearing the mention of family from Pele when first entering Harga territory. Pele, you know all these people? These are my family. Danny comes from a dour land of sadness and isolation, but fate has guided her to this fantastical land of happiness and sunshine. <laughs> Arriving just when she needs it. And while Christian's approach to dealing with the poison within Danny is to withdraw from and ignore her emotions, which in turn causes a concealed resentment of her and her baggage, the Harga impart acceptance and gratitude for the cycle of life and death and every living thing's place in it. Can you feel that? The energy coming up from the earth? Nature just knows instinctually how to stay in harmony. We'd be hard pressed to deny that this is clearly a wisdom Danny requires an understanding of in order to heal from her trauma, a wisdom that is practically vacant in the culture she comes from. And though from the logical perspective there's more than enough to criticize about the Harga's relationship with death, we'll get to that side of the coin soon enough, emotionally we can recognize the benefits of the Harga's way of being on Danny's mental state pretty immediately. It's felt from the jump in the majestic score that accompanies Danny's expressions of intrigue when first discovering her soon to be new home. However, Danny does question if this is an environment she wants to be in when witnessing firsthand the Harga's ritualistic embracing of death. This scene forces her to confront the horrifying truth of what her sister cursed their family with. Death in broad daylight, no longer repressed in darkness. And while this gruesome ritual initially frightens Danny, the Harga seem to know their customs, as shocking as they may be to outsiders, are precisely the catharsis Danny needs to purge out the poison within her that together, as one unit, they can accept and integrate death into their lives, see dying as great an honor as living is, thus cleansing life of the burden of tragedy. We view life as a circle, a recycle. We give our life as a gesture. It does no good dying, lashing back at the inevitable. It corrupts the spirit. The Harga see a kindred spirit in Danny, and know a devotion to their ways can free her in the same way it's freed them. I never got the chance to feel lost because I had a family here <laughs> where everyone embraced me and swept me up. But I have always felt held by a family, 
a real family, which everyone deserves. And you deserve it. From what the movie shows us, the Harga appear to be among the happiest people on the planet, making it seem as though they might have this whole life thing figured out better than most of us. We can still register their sacrificing of outsiders as immoral, of course, but at the same time, a strange sense of respect can come out of seeing that they are just as willing to sacrifice themselves for their beliefs that their purpose in life extends beyond the self. They live by a code, devoted fully and never wavering. Meanwhile, Christian seems confused at best when it comes to knowing what makes him happy and how to live authentically, let alone how to assist Danny in that department. Above all else, it's thoroughly emphasized throughout that the Harga have Danny's personal interests at heart, whereas Christian has only his own. When Christian forgets her birthday, she puts the blame on herself. I forgot to remind him and it's, it's not his fault. Rather than on her boyfriend of four years. She feels it's only okay to acknowledge Christian's in the wrong when he insists she should. I'm not upset, it's okay. You should be. I, sh I should be. Pele and the Harga set out to make Danny aware that she can put herself and her emotions first rather than ignoring them and blaming herself for having them in the first place. Danny, do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? They genuinely want to show her that she has worth outside of this toxic relationship. It's because Danny is a passive character, with the choice only between two deterministic paths that will guide her far beyond the final frames of the movie, Christian or the Harga, that we find ourselves in favor of the trail most accommodating to Danny's basic human needs. Because she's our protagonist. She's who we've been steeped in the emotion of, and who we know requires better than what she's been stuck with. This pro Danny's choice perspective offers a fairy tale fantasy with horrifying consequences, but it's a fantasy that speaks to us nonetheless. A fantasy of finding light where before there was only darkness, of being embraced when neglect was all you knew, of shedding the cold of depression and being rebirthed in the warmth of happiness. Stepping back from our emotional connection to Danny and taking a more logical look with a healthy dose of basic morality, the Harga come off less like happy fairy folk Danny saviors and more like deranged whack job Danny brainwashers. There's a difference. And the latter may earn them the reward for most casually fucked up horror villains in recent memory. From this perspective, the Harga may have conveniently triggered Danny to recognize her trauma and unaddressed needs, but their so-called healing through the witnessing and integrating of death comes off more like an excuse for some serious sadism. They're less healing Danny of that dark poison inside of her and more showing her how to become one with its sickness and therefore one with them. Display it proudly in the light rather than flush it out with the light. You lost your sister and parents to a horrific death. So let us show you how to make death and mutilation as mundane as taking out the trash. This is sure to help your spirit flourish. It may at first seem as though the Harga notice a lost soul in need of a loving family such as them, but as the wheels of the Harga likability wagon barrel off, it appears more like this group of demented individuals recognize someone on the verge of a psychotic break in Danny. Someone who only requires the slightest nudge into the kind of full-blown insanity they've embraced. It does no good dodging, lashing back at the inevitable corrupts the spirit. In this case, Danny's gleeful grin as she watches her boyfriend burn to death while this kooky cult does the nutjob twist becomes the imagery of a woman snapping and losing her mind. Contextualizing this as a cautionary tale of a person's mental health needs going unmet and leaving a vacancy for the wrong kind of people with the very wrong kind of principles to show up and take the wheel. One constant in whichever angle we look at Midsommar from is that Pele is genuine in his conviction that the Harga offer the perfect home for Danny, just as they did for him, because he was orphaned as a child and they took him in when he had no one else. My parents, they <laughs> burned up in a fire and I became technically an orphan. And though it's often debated if this actually confirms the Harga murdered Pele's parents in one of their past rituals, I think it's safe to assume specifying fire as their cause of death was no accident, so I'm counting it. The scene where Pele appeals to Danny's heart then becomes all the more unsettling in retrospect because Pele is manipulating Danny here. 
but he's been brainwashed and indoctrinated since he was young and is blissfully oblivious to the fact that he's a kidnapped victim himself. And he's talking another soon-to-be victim into accepting cult assimilation and framing it as something as kind and loving as being held. Now Pele's dialogue about how nature binds everyone and everything together Nature just knows instinctually how to stay in harmony resonates less as a wise observation about accepting the natural cycle of life and death that we're all connected to, and more like Pele expressing the Harga's twisted virtues. Everything just mechanically doing its part. Because that's what's expected of you if you're part of the Harga hive mind, to mechanically do your part. Like a cog in a machine, you're not accepted as an individual, but for your ability to, like a robot, serve the assigned greater good. Danny is so easily seduced by this idea because she's desperate for any sense of connection at this point in her life. And like a dutiful Harga zombie, Pele is, as we see quite literally in this moment, removing Christian from the picture while Danny's enchanted by the Harga's surrounding beauty. Pele and the Harga have a pre-assigned fate in store for her. Her best interests are only something to be maneuvered into aligning with theirs, to shape her into just another disposable cog in the machine. This is a deterministic path that Danny has taken on without any say in the matter, and we can be tricked into thinking it's the better of two options for Danny. But when we zoom in with our handy dandy movie magnifying glasses, we realize the Harga have been rigged to be her only option, not just by her new family, but by her original one as well. One of the earliest shots in the movie is of Danny's parents slowly dying in their sleep with thanks to Danny's wonderful sister. And on the nightstand right next to them is a picture of Danny with a bouquet of flowers arranged around her head, symbolizing her fate as the May Queen. Which shows us that though Danny didn't literally die with her family that night, her sister still did kill her in a sense. Because this inciting action is what leads to Danny and Christian clinging ever tighter to a relationship that was about to end. Which then leads to Danny going to Sweden with Christian and his friends, which all tornadoes into her being drugged, brainwashed, and assimilated into a monstrous cult. A fate arguably worse than death. A corruption of her morality and a complete loss of self. All ignited by the simple fact that this was the family she just so happened to be born into. Danny's choices are narrowed first by her family tragedy and even further by the Harga until she's steeped in the illusion that this new home is her only fitting option. And the flower motif is used to convey this elimination of choice a lot more than just in the beginning. It's a flower-laden trail that leads Danny and the others into the Harga's entrance, and flower-petaled pathways that separate Danny and Christian to get them in just the place they need to be in order to steer Danny into choosing to kill Christian by the end. What's that? That's not for us. I think you should not. And this all contributes to how we, the audience, can be manipulated into siding with the Harga too. Because flowers aren't exactly the typical tool in your average horror movie villain's arsenal. And the fact that the Harga are visually identified with brightness throws us off. Because we've identified heroes as the light and villains as the dark for about as long as stories have been around. But Midsommar flips this notion on its head, disorienting us like Danny after way too much sunshine and psychedelics. The Harga are the dictators of every character's fate, and they serve up some pretty lousy destinies for all, including themselves. Any thought that Danny has found a cozy new home for herself evaporates when considering the movie provides subtle indications that not every one of these psychotic flower children are as happy-go-lucky as they initially seem. The female villager assigned with luring Mark away so he could be killed off screen can later be spotted with cuts all over her face, indicating Mark put up a fight before his demise and being tasked with assisting in murdering Mark appears to weigh heavily on this particular Hargeteer's conscience, as for a very brief moment, she can be seen crying while one of her fellow cultists talks her out of her pesky moral conflict and back into that good old effortless groupthink. And then there's the fact that just before the allegedly enlightened Ingmar and Ulf go out in the final blaze, they're promised by a trusty elder that as a reward for their loyalty and devotion, they won't feel pain while burning to death. But as it becomes clear this promise was quite the false one, fear in Ingmar's face indicates a realization in his final moments that the Harga are built on a foundation of lies. You sit on a throne of lies. Though it's not outright shown or said, it's hard to believe the Harga's elders are more driven by a devotion to nature and their sun god or whatever than by a tribalistic vengeance and bloodlust. It's one thing to see the honor in a culture that chooses to die before growing too old, but it's a whole other to add bashing in your dying elders' brains until their face turns to mashed potatoes. As of course is tradition. And what of the fact that the Harga engage in inbreeding to create their village oracles? 
It's insane, that's what of. The elders take their disabled's paint goop drawings and interpret them as their doctrine. He draws and we, the elders, interpret. It would be quite the delusional fantasy to believe that these elders are accessing some sacred knowledge by looking at these color vomit smears and not just imposing whatever rule they see fit through them. This poses the Harga as a religion of hierarchy, one shaped by the authority of its elders, yet masquerades as a commune of equality. So when it's revealed in the end that four outsiders needed to be sacrificed for their deity, it's awfully convenient that those four outsiders also risk exposing the Harga's crimes against humanity once they returned home. Except Mark, who was punished for taking a whiz on their sacred tree. I just had to pee. I didn't know it was special. In any case, this all tells us that the Harga are more fueled by barbaric retribution than their happy, hippie, sunshine, fairy family vibe would at first let on. Every one of the core characters are moved around like they're part of the Harga's personal plaything collection, as is shown to us literally in very disturbing fashion by the end, in order to satisfy the whims of the Harga. Whether that entails being tortured and killed, or deemed fitting enough for indoctrination, or insemination, any agency the main characters may have imagined they had was all but an illusion, cast by some pretty evil people. We may at first believe Danny at least ended up with the more fulfilling of two options when it comes to Christian or the Harga, but this just doesn't hold up so well with the objective look. With Danny as our protagonist, it's easy to see Christian as the villain. However, Christian may be bad for Danny, but he's not necessarily a bad person in general. At least no worse than your average self-interested college bro lacking direction in his life. Fuck you. No, do not fuck me! The movie is careful to show Christian, along with Josh and Mark, as identifiable only through their broadest, most one-dimensional qualities. It defines them by their flaws and conceals any further nuance. But it's also not hard to see that Danny has some essentialistic flaws of her own, and she's dragged straight to her demise by them no different than the rest of the group. Danny and Christian's relationship is portrayed as an almost comically over-the-top codependent relationship. I love you. I love you. Danny, the classic anxious attachment type, and Christian on the farthest side of the avoidance spectrum. And when it comes to codependency, it takes two emotionally insecure parties to tango. Christian may be guilty of callously withdrawing from Danny, but Danny holds an equal responsibility for so desperately clinging to what so clearly isn't working. Christian is slightly represented as an overbearing and burdensome bear in Danny's life so we can rejoice when that toxic bear burns in eternal fire. But realistically, both Danny and Christian are passive agents lacking the strength to take action against a dead relationship they're both guilty of pretending is still alive and well. And though this is understandable given the devastating tragedy that made acknowledging their truth infinitely more challenging, the great hurdle Danny really must overcome for optimal self-actualization is her need for any external caring for, whether that's from Christian or the Harga. Danny practically thirsts for being tended to like a helpless infant, seen in how she observes the Harga newborns with a hint of longingness. The babies are raised here by everyone. Wow. You want this? She has an unhealthy desire for anyone but herself to choose the direction of her life, to define what home should mean for her. The Harga aren't actually representative of a freedom, but rather a further imprisonment from Danny's inability to take initiative and guide her own life. Her relationship with Christian may be a negative symptom of this flaw, but the Harga are the cancer that ultimately consumes her because of it. This Danny's been transformed into a murderous cult queen perspective offers a delusional fantasy of telling yourself you've conquered the shadow of your past, only for a darker, more malevolent shadow to take its place, as it offers you the illusion of love and tranquility in exchange for the eradication of your soul, resulting in an insanity that you have no choice but to embrace with a smile. When it comes to these two very different ways of looking at Midsommar, I think their equal validity is best captured in this scene between Danny and Pele. Pele, an orphan like Danny, reaching his hand out to her with empathy, seeing himself in her, thus seeing her with a clarity no one else has seen her with. It's precisely what our protagonist desires most, and what we the audience desire for her. Emotionally, we're sold. Then the scene abruptly cuts away to this. A not-so-subtle, very-much-in-our-face reminder of how depraved the Harga can be when a ritual calls for it, yanking the rug out from an emotionally sincere moment where we see the Harga in a positive light, as a true answer to Danny's needs, 
before suddenly casting us into an objective reminder of the mind virus this group of radical religious zealots are guided by. All in all, Midsommar is a movie composed of many contradicting truths, a not-so-fixed shape that offers more than one dimension for us to observe from. It's paradoxical, and yet, it works. Pele is conspiring to lure his friends to their deaths. He is brainwashing Danny to embrace murder. And he's also doing all this with a real concern for what he's been taught is the greater good, with a real concern for Danny's well-being. The Harga are an evil cult with some severely inhumane tendencies, and they experience a sense of happiness and community that many people in contemporary society, sadly, never will. The movie itself is manipulating us in the same way the characters are being manipulated, and it's an honest story of overcoming trauma, depression, and a toxic relationship of finding the place where you're accepted as you are. And the fact that there's been such a charged and passionate discourse around defending all kinds of opposing perspectives like these only goes to show just how powerfully effective the movie can be. The horror you'll take away from Midsommar has everything to do with what you make of the destination. For some, this might be the horror of being in a relationship that's holding you back from personal growth. Therefore, to you, the ending may offer a guilty, or not so guilty, sense of relief from a heavy burden. If being taken advantage of by ill-intentioned people hiding behind a smiling veil of kindness is your idea of a terrifying time, you just may register this ending as the horror of your vulnerabilities being exploited for others' gains, leaving you all the worse as a result. Point is, our way of looking at it is only a way of looking at it, not a reliably fixed and unmoving truth. Danny's smile at the end is that of happiness. That's about as much as we could really know from it. And who are we to definitively say it's what's best for her or not? She's found a family that understands her at a time of experiencing a relentless depression and loneliness, and that, like any illness, could very well have meant the end of Danny had she not found a tribe willing to take her in. Would she really even survive returning to modern civilization? Her fate very well may have ended same as her sister in that case, taking her own life as a result of this depression. At least with the Harga, Danny experiences some actual happiness. Even if she's chosen at random to be sacrificed for some stupid ritual only a week after the movie ends, we could still argue that even the briefest experience of pure happiness is a better fate than returning to where you don't belong to further deteriorate in isolation. She may have withered away and died in darkness without ever having known the light of life. On the other hand, we could argue that Danny still ends up no different than her sister anyway, making a choice to murder her family, Christian in this case, while in the throes of a psychotic break and misidentifying it as a release from the darkness. This is the beauty of the ending of Midsommar. It can communicate that it's not all okay, that no amount of flower petals and brightness can ever cover up the darkness that has swallowed all that you are. The truth cannot be concealed. Or it can communicate that it is going to be okay. That the natural cycle of all things, the very changing of the seasons, will wash away the darkness, bring about a clarity you couldn't imagine possible when the clouds were as thick as they were. The sun has the power to fill you with life. Or it can burn you beyond recognition. It's all a matter of perspective.